Hi guys. So today we are going to do a session all about e-collars. So I don't have Rika here because I need to give my full attention to Mr. Larry Crone because he is going to go over everything about the e-collar, uh, the pros, the cons, um, the benefits of it. I know that there are, there's a lot of controversy over the e-collar. So I wanted to have Mr. Larry Crone on to explain the device. Let me invite him in. All right. Request has been sent. Hey. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing okay, what's going on? Nothing, I'm excited to talk to you. We've had so many people request you. Oh, that's very flattering, thank you. I'm not too good with the Instagram stuff, so I was I was nervous. I was like, okay, am I in the wrong place or what? <laughs> well, luckily I'm late, it's, it's all good. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So I wanted to talk to you about the, the e-collar. Sure. So, a little background, um, Rika is now eight months and mm -hmm. we haven't used the e-collar. We bought the mini educator um, when she was like eight, eight to 10 weeks old, a Malinois mm -hmm. trainer suggested it, but um, we didn't know how to use it. And so I want to talk to you about it. Awesome. Yeah. A ask, ask away anything, anything at all that you want to talk about, we can cover. Okay. So our main hesitation in the beginning was... I don't want the device to tell Rika that her behavior is wrong. Like sure. I want her, like me, the owner, to be the one like saying this is the correct behavior. This is what we don't want. Mm hmm. Sure. Well, that, see, that's that's a hey guys. Can you get mango? That's a a big misconception that so many people have. All right. Um, and no matter how much information we put out there. And we've been doing it for years now. And a lot of people have, not just me. Too many are still using it as a no, as a stop, instead of a gas pedal and a motivator. And that's why so many people struggle with it. So even the people that believe they're using it like I am or like others, and they're not using it as only a negative, they still are. In other words, they're only using it to get the dog to do something or to stop the dog from doing something. And where they're failing is they're not taking the time separately to teach the dog the meaning of something so foreign to them. You know, that sensation is so unbelievably strange and foreign. And if you just take a few weeks to educate the dog on what it means and how they can find their benefit in it, it's a game changer. It's a game changer for so many people, you know, and uh, can you use it to make everything the dog knows better, faster, sharper? Absolutely. hundred percent. You know, can you use it to stop unwanted behaviors? hundred percent. Absolutely. It's just that most people go to that a little too fast, you know, a little too quick. So I've seen you with, with your dog you're in a great position to do so because you already have a tremendous relationship. The obedience is great. The relationship is there. So I guess now my question to you would be, what would be your main goal with your dog for the e-collar? Um, really is place, really is um, now, right after you said that, is um, really fine tuning. And sure. like get the recall down perfect. Um, obviously there's no perfect, but just hold on. I'm going to put sure. her in the crate. Sure. This is the first time I'm doing it without Rika next to me. <laughs> I have a bad connection. goals for the e-collar really just to fine-tune her training sure sure and you're you're in a great position to do that because the training's already there you've you've put in you've put in the work okay and it's a good age to start i think most people 
get too excited about jumping into it and they think it's this magic trick you you know it's a it's a magic button you push a button and all these great things happen and the truth is it's not all it is is an amplifier of your training you know if you've already done a great job with the training and you have a good connection with with your dog then it's going to make everything better but if you don't it's going to be a disaster you're going to fail you, you know what i mean and and the way that i teach it the way i've been teaching it for years i, I keep it so simple and when I wrote the book, it was geared towards the average dog owner with no dog training ability. Mm -hmm. So even if they mess things up, they couldn't mess their dog up. Does that make sense? Yeah. And because it really is simple. It really is very easy and very basic and, and, and very, very simple. But most people make it way too complicated. And it doesn't have to be complicated at all. You've already done the hard part. And that you put in the work to train your dog. It's there. The training's there. So now it's super, super easy, you know, super easy. Um, what can be a little tougher with some of the working dogs, especially some of the Malinois, I condition almost every dog the same, okay? Quiet. Really, one of the more difficult dogs I had to condition was Luca, my older Malinois. And, and and that's because from eight weeks old, he was never off of me. His eyes never left me. You know, he never got off of me. So as to where most dogs, we start conditioning the dog with the recall. With him, I had to condition him to the send away. Maybe you better bring that dog next to you. Okay. I, I think so. Hold on. Hey, Kevin, it's uh, everything you need to know about e-collar training. It's on Amazon. Amazon's the only place you can get it. It's 10 bucks. I kept it very cheap so anyone could, could have it. And uh, it's, it's very simple, easy read. The crate training is the hardest thing right now. Um, I, it's hard if I'm down here talking. Um, or mm -hmm. doing something, she is crying and wants to get out. And it's my fault because I do let her out. Sure. <laughs> Not all the time. Or if sure. I don't let her out, Dave will let her out because Dave's working and on conference calls. Gotcha. So he can't no, have yeah. her crying. Yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. She gets it too. <laughs> yeah. She's, she knows she's what no she's dummy. doing. Yeah. yeah. She, she's no dummy. But someone like you is never going to mess your dog up, Okay. Um, sim simply, so simply because of the fact that you waited and you wanted to do it right and you didn't rush into it, you know, and you put the work into your dog. So it wouldn't even be an issue there. There would be, you, you wouldn't have a, an issue messing your dog up. You, you know, you just go slow and you take your time and don't focus on the obedience. People focus on the obedience with the e-collar, right? They're trying to get the obedience, even when they're starting out. I don't. I use the obedience that the dog knows to teach the e-collar. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Totally opposite of what most people think. And, and yeah. that's why they get it so easily. And not just my dogs, you know, high drive. I'm talking about everyday average pet dogs. You know, we, we do it where there's no confusion. There's no down in the dumps. You know, there's no sadness because there's, there's not even discomfort in the beginning. There's, there's none of that. It's just pairing negative reinforcement with positive reinforcement, lots of repetitions in a good way. You know, we make it very enjoyable for the dog. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can you, sh can you show me how it works? Because I, I know, and I, I've seen videos of the, the stimulation and can you just explain it like e-collars for dummies? Yeah, sure. Sure. And, and, and I've, and I've done that a ton. So when we're done with this, I I'll send you a bunch of videos. When I put those videos out, it's usually the first e-collar sessions with dogs because that's where people need to see and they need to see the dog's response. They need to see how we do it. But a couple of the more popular videos, I did two with my daughter, one when she was very little and one about two years ago. And I demonstrated as a trainer how I teach clients, how we start off the training with clients, which is very beneficial, okay? 
For one, I would suggest well, – let me see what kind of contact points you have on that collar, the contact points on the receiver. I'd get rid of them and order yourself the winged contacts for okay. long-haired dogs from e-collar tech, okay? Because one of the biggest issues we have with e-collar training is contact, making good contact. That's one of the biggest issues. If you're not making good time contact, you're not going to have consistency, and that can create a lot of confusion for the dog. And then you can wind up hitting the dog with higher levels than necessary because it's not consistent, okay? So those wing contact points for long-haired dogs make make it a game changer when it comes to making good consistent contact i think they're like 30 bucks or 35 bucks or something but well worth it it's the only thing i use on dogs anymore unless it's like a doberman or a german short hair pointer or a pit bull something with really short hair you know what i mean okay so let's say in your case your dog's eight months old you've already put in a lot of training okay right? um does your dog accept food and training perfect so we always like to start with food if possible. That's where we, we want to go, you know. You want to start off with minimal distractions, no distractions if, po if possible, preferably on concrete or blacktop, no grass, too many distractions in grass. Because you got to remember, when we're starting off, we're looking for the lowest level that the dog perceives. I mean, it should be so low that the dog's not even sure if it's feeling something, okay? And when you first put the collar on that dog and you start at a number one and you tap and you go to a number two and you tap, you're looking at the dog for some kind of subtle hint that it feels something. And sometimes it's very subtle. Sometimes it might just be a blink of the eye. It might be a little ear twitch. Or the dog could be sitting there breathing with its mouth open and then close its mouth. You know, other times it's very obvious. The dog may look behind it like it, it, it you know, a mosquito landed on it or something. So that's the first thing you have to learn is to pay attention to your dog and see when it gives you some kind of sign. Once you see the dog that gives you some kind of sign, okay, now we're ready to begin start conditioning the dog to the e-collar. Okay, that's where we're starting at the lowest level perceived. I like to use a 10 foot line. I used to use 15 foot lines. In my book and a lot of the videos, you'll see a 15-foot line, but too many people struggle with it getting tangled and everything. Mm -hmm. So I prefer the 10-foot line over, over the 15-foot. So you're going to go out. You're going to let your dog be a dog. You don't need its attention, okay? Now you have the dog's working level. You have the dog's meal on you, okay? It hasn't eaten yet. It's a little bit hungry. The problem with a lot of the Malinois, a lot of the working dogs, they're used to interacting with you and they're always looking for something to do. So they may not take it, their eyes off of you. You want to create a little space, okay? The second the dog strays away from you on the leash, you're not going to use the leash, all right? You're going to press down on the continuous button, okay? The stimulation starts going, okay? Yep, top button there, that the one fast. above the red. Yeah, you have to have the e-collar set up so it's on continuous, all right? And I can send you videos on how I do that and everything. The e-collar comes on. The dog doesn't know what that is. It's your job to teach the dog what that is. Now, your dog already knows the recall. and We want dogs to know a recall already. So at that moment, you're going to say the dog's name. You're going to say come or hear, whatever you use. And the second the dog turns to come your way, not when it's halfway there, not when it gets to you. I mean, literally the second the dog is responding in, in the proper way, you release the e-collar pressure and you mark it with a yes or a click or whatever you use and the dog gets rewarded. Okay, so you're starting off with negative reinforcement. The e-collar comes on. The dog responding removes the pressure. That's the negative reinforcement. Okay, then you're following up with the reward, with the positive reinforcement. The dog learns very quickly, very so the, quickly. So the dog wants it to continue, and then when it stops? No, 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 no. The dog's learning how to turn it off, okay? Oh, so the second, okay. the second the dog responds properly, as soon as it starts turning, e-collar pressure goes away, and you mark. So your dog, what's your dog's reward marker? Yes. Okay. So the second it turns your way, e-collar goes away, you mark with a yes. Now, because the dog knows the reward marker, that should build speed coming to you. 
for the reward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And you're doing very short sessions like that because remember, we don't care about the obedience. All we care about is teaching the dog this very strange foreign language. It has no idea what that is. Mm -hmm. And we do three things together to start teaching the dog what that is. We use the verbal command that the dog knows. We use the e-collar stimulation, which it doesn't know. And that's why we always have the dog on leash until it's completely trained. Because we don't want to give the dog a chance to blow us off. Because we don't increase levels at all through the whole mm -hmm. process. That leash is there so that if the dog's not responding, the e-collar stays on and you give very, very subtle straight line pressure with the leash towards you, guiding. I mean, very subtle. Again, as little as possible, okay? That tells the dog, hey, come my way. And again, the second it turns to come your way, leash pressure goes away, e-collar pressure goes away. We mark with the yes and we reward. And you do short sessions like that, five minutes here, five minutes there. And you can, you can quickly add the place command if the dog knows a place command. Because we like to teach dogs opposite behaviors. Come to me, go away from me. Come to me, go away from me. So maybe you do this for one day. And then day two, you continue with the recall. But now we're also going to add the place command or go away from me. This way, the dog starts to understand that just because it feels the e-collar doesn't have to come running to you. Now we start teaching and pay attention to the commands, okay? And it's in, they catch on so fast when you do it this way. And they enjoy the training because there is no discomfort like many people think, okay? It's just barely feeling something. That's the way we teach it. So later on down the road, when we get into that next phase, that intermittent phase, where we really start up in the training and we start adding some distance and we start adding duration to the commands and we start adding real distractions and we start adding where we're not using the e-collar every time, we're not rewarding every time, we start mixing it up. There, now we start prepping the dog for the real world, okay? Mm -hmm. And if we have to start adding corrections at that time, we do. Nothing major, but let's say, for example, what I just described to you is that first part, that conditioning phase, right? We might do that for two days, three days. Some people may do it for a week or two, depending on your skill level, okay? I'm usually going to be done with that in two days, three days at most, depending on the dog. Now, when we move to that next phase, we come into that intermittent phase where we're using those four combinations that I talked about. Those four combinations are we're using the e-collar with a reward, just like we did in the conditioning phase that we just talked about, okay? We're using the e-collar without a reward. For example, all right, e-collar comes on, we say place, the dog jumps on a place, e-collar goes away, we don't mark, we don't reward. Now the dog's got to hold it until we release the dog, free dog or whatever you use, okay? Because we're not going to just use food and continue rewarding forever, all right? That's the second combination. And then the third combination is we don't use the e-collar. You, you know, right, a place gets up there. Yes, we reward. Okay? Three mm -hmm. combinations. Fourth combination is no e-collar, no reward. Mm -hmm. And you practice all four of those because in the long run, this is where a lot of people fail. They say, my dog does great with the e-collar on, but the second the e-collar is off, the dog ignores me, you know? And that's because they're failing in that section. They're not putting enough time in their training with and without it, with food, with food. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I'm really, really glad to hear you say that, uh, that the goal is for her not to have the e-collar on. Always. Absolutely. So that was my fear. If I start training her with the e-collar, um, once we get her to a point where she, you know, is good at stay, you know, she sits mm -hmm. and she, she stays in the recall, um, mm -hmm. If I take it off her, will it become sloppy? No, no. Yeah. It, it, um, a lot of people experience that because they don't go through the training process properly. And they go too quickly. They get rid of the leash too quick. So now the dog's blowing them off and they start jacking up levels and correcting the dog. Or they just put the e-collar on. They start training. Mm -hmm. And then when they're done, the e-collar comes off. You know, and all of those things are things I've discussed at nauseum in all the YouTube videos and the Facebook videos and in the in the book I talk about it step by step. That's why the dog becomes collar wise. With my dogs, 
any one of my dogs, I could take anywhere off leash with no e-collar. Anywhere. It doesn't matter where we go, right? But if we go out in public, I'm always going to have an e-collar on my dogs. Because you have to have something to protect that animal for that what-if moment. Mm -hmm. You have to, okay? You have to be able to prepare for if something goes wrong. They're animals. They make mistakes. Other animals make mistakes, people. Okay, so it's always there just in case. But the beautiful thing about when you do the training properly and you take your time and you make it a, a, a pleasant experience for the dog, when you do it properly, you find yourself rarely ever having to use it once you get in that maintenance phase. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You know, and, it, and it's just so much easier than people think. People like to complicate it and come up with all this fancy shit and, you know, all these new theories. It's not necessary. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary. So when people ask me, why does every dog you work look happy with an e-collar? I say, because they are. It never experiences anything bad. And the thing is, if a few weeks into training, a month into training, two weeks into training, it doesn't matter. If that dog, say a client's dog, takes, takes off after a deer, and we do correct it at a high level, there's no confusion there. The dog doesn't come back down in the dumps and sad and confused. The dog comes flying back and is like, okay, I get it. <laughs> I know exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. But you have to prepare the dog for that. You, mm -hmm. you have to be fair to the animal and you have to prep the dog for worst case scenario. And if you do that properly, you never have an issue. Never with any dog, I promise. I think a big um, worry is, or not, I, I think the big thing is going into e-collar work, like knowing that it's work and that you have to like wrap your head around it. Because even you explaining like the, the conditioning with the like continuous mm -hmm. um, pulses, um, it's kind of hard to wrap my head around it. Sure. I haven't actually done it. Um, sure. So can you like, I don't know if, if this is possible, but like, show me i know the skittle video can we kind of do that yeah well that listen that's extremely beneficial with clients because like you just said you can explain it to people all day long until they actually experience the mechanics and the timing there's confusion and several years ago i stopped doing that i stopped the role playing with clients because i was like this is so corny i hate doing this but what i found was the second I stopped doing that, people started struggling, okay? And so anybody who's watching, if they're not sure what we're talking about, when I start a new client, now remember, most of these people are pet dog owners. They have no dog training ability whatsoever. And now I have the responsibility of teaching them how to use this tool very responsibly to where it's always humane for the animal, right? So the first thing I do is I go over all the functions and the mechanics for the most part. But then they're the dog to start off. They have the e-collar in the palm of their hand, okay? They're holding the leash in the other hand. Now, they're the dog. So just like with the dog, I'm starting. I have the remote, and I'm starting at one, two, three, four, five, and I'm going up until they feel something, all right? And I tell the people, when you feel something, you let me know. Remember, this is the same thing we're doing with the dog. And the second they feel something, they say, oh, okay, I feel that. I'm like, okay, you sure you feel that? Yes, okay. Now I say, don't move it in your hand. Because just like for the dog, if you move your grip or you put it on a different part of your hand, you may feel it higher, it may feel stronger, or you may not feel it at all, just like on the dog. The dog feels it differently on all parts of its neck. Now we have that person's working level, right? First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give her or him the recall command. I'm going to say, you know, Bob here. And e-collar comes on first. And the second Bob takes a step towards me, the e-collar comes off. I say yes, and I pretend to reward. And they're like, oh, okay. But they get to feel it. Mm -hmm. And we do that several times. And then we do different things before I become the dog. Now they're the handler. And I'm going to be the dog. And I'm going to do things that dogs are going to do. I'm going to hesitate. I'm not going to respond right away. I'm going to start coming towards them and then veer off. And that's how they get to make all the mistakes on me instead of the dog. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so I know 
when they're ready to start with the dog by how they're doing it with me. And I also use a sound box. I use a sound box. So when they do start working with the dog, once I give them the remote, I could hear what they're doing. But when we first start working with the client's dog, the client has the leash, the client has the reward, I have the remote. I'm doing the work at first, so the dog starts off experiencing it correctly, timing and everything, okay? Then once the dog is comfortable and it's rocking and rolling, I say, okay, you ready? Now it's your turn. And I have the sound box, so I know if their timing is correct. And so people struggle at first. They make mistakes. But the way we teach it, we keep it so simple. They're not going to mess up the dog. You know what I mean? They're just not going to do it. And that little role-playing thing there, it's so silly. But like I said, when I stopped doing it, people struggled. I said, okay, I have to go back to, to doing it. You know what I mean? And like the Skittles video and stuff, as silly as it is, that makes sense to people. You know? It, yeah. it, it really does, for sure. You know? So, um I had actually, so someone was asking, she was, she's in Lebanon and she was saying how she watches your videos all the time and she, her dog is eating stuff off the ground and there's sure. poisonous stuff on the ground where she, yeah, right. she's, she was asking, um, should she use the, uh, like the stimulus, um, like, uh, what kind of tapping should you do? Like the, no, don't do it or. Uh, well, in, in, in that situation, this is what I'm going to do, okay? E-collar is, is the most effective way to stop a dog or correct a dog when it's not next to you on a leash, okay? That, that it's, there, there's no, you can't argue that. But even in that situation, I'm going to be fair to the dog and train it first. So in her situation, if that's me, that dog's not going to be off a leash and have the opportunity to do that until I could put in a few weeks of training very consistently with the e-collar so the dog gets it, okay? Now, the first time the dog's off leash and goes to eat something bad, I would prefer to be away from the dog and even hidden if I can't, you know what I mean? If I can't, no big deal. The second the dog goes down to touch something that it can't, that's very dangerous, I'm going to correct the dog at a high level for that without saying anything, okay? I don't want that correction associated with me. One of the biggest problems we have with e-collar training is the way people do it, they create a lot of suspicious behaviors. The dog's not sure what's going on. There's confusion. There are times we want to create suspicious behavior, just like if your dog goes in the yard and digs big holes or chews on your wires, you know, for, to your, your friggin' cable or something like that. Those are things or your rose bushes. Those are things you want to create suspicion of, like an underground fence. So that's where you set yourself up inside the house. You get a place where you can watch the dog. And the second the dog goes to do what you want to stop, you correct the dog from inside without being associated with. And you make that situation suspicious for the dog. Like, screw that. I'm not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. You understand? Incredibly effective. And things like this keep dogs in the home. OK, I mean, because so many people give their dogs up because of bad behaviors like this and they don't know what to do. They just don't. But let me be very clear. The people that run out and get an e-collar because they're going to try to fix a problem, it's never going to work. You're always going to do damage and create more problems. Just don't do it. You have to put in a little work, even if it's even if it's a week long of consistent work it's a lot better than not doing anything. You know what I mean? But listen, in two or three weeks, you can have a really well-trained dog on the e-collar if you do it right. You really can, you know? And I'm talking about the average dog owner, not a professional dog trainer. Professional dog trainers could achieve, achieve wonderful things with this tool. They really can. Mm -hmm. you know? What age do you think is best for someone to start e-collar e training? I don't like starting too early. I like to do as much training as I can without it because I don't teach anything with the e-collar, nothing, okay? Nothing is taught with the e-collar. Anything we utilize the e-collar for when it comes to obedience, the dog was taught with food through positive reinforcement. That's it, period. Some people start really early. I prefer at least six or seven months old. Um, I've done five months old before. It's not an issue, but I know what I'm doing. Luca, my Malinois, was nine months old. Um, 
we have a golden doodle that I, I, I started at uh, five months old. That was early for me, okay? But there was a reason why. We had just built a new house, and we had no grass. It was winter, so everything was mud. So I had to keep the dog on a leash while my other dogs were running around. Not that the dog would run away, but I didn't want the dog in the mud every single day. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I came home one day at five months old, and I told my little girl, it was her dog, I said, today we start training Buddy to be off leash. And I, I did the videos. They're on YouTube. And by day two, day two, he was completely off leash and reliable. And I could steer him away from anything I wanted without punishing him, you know? It's off-leash communication. And when you do it right, there's nothing you can't do with it. Like, very, very effective, okay? So, at least six or seven months old, I prefer. Okay. All right. I'm just noticing these, all the, uh, the comments. I, someone asked, hold on. <laughs> Pack leader said, he's such a dick. How long have you <laughs> had that hat? First of all, it's distressed. It's not beaten up. It came like that. <laughs> okay, Arch the Schnauzer. <laughs> I like your hat. Arch the Schnauzer is asking, Larry, can you explain the idea of pressure before com command versus after command? Sure. Negative reinforcement. It's that simple. The dog finds its best situation. You empower the dog to better its situation. Okay? The pressure comes on. The dog learns how to respond and turn off pressure. We're not turning it off, the dog does. And let me tell you where that's very effective. E-collars do tremendous things with insecure, fearful dogs, like really tremendous things, okay? And years ago, I used to tell people, when we start the e-collar work with these fearful dogs, unbelievable things happen. I didn't know why. I couldn't really explain it, okay? I had my suspicions, but I didn't know. And then as I've done this year after year over and over, what I realized was when you take a dog that's scared of everything, scared of the world, has never had a win, right? All of a sudden, we start teaching with the e-collar. We start conditioning the dog to the e-collar, something completely foreign, right? In the beginning, all dogs experience some confusion when they first feel the e-collar. All dogs. They don't know what it is. What's wonderful about that confusion in the beginning is when the dog becomes a little confused, it no longer can be fearful. It can no longer be aggressive. It's focused on this very foreign stimulation that it has no idea what it is. And the second it starts to learn how to make it go away, not only make it go away, but then receive a reward, the dog blows up, the chest blows up, the head comes up and changes. They just change instantly okay now with that being said that's a good question once the dog is trained okay then we're no longer utilizing the e-collar before we're doing that more for training purposes i'll give you an example in the intermittent phase those four combinations let's say your dog is off leash it's 50 yards away and we're going to call the dog no e-collar okay we say rex come if the dog doesn't respond immediately, that's where we're following up with a tap after the command, when the dog doesn't respond. Does that make sense? That's once we get to that stage where we're not utilizing the e-collar beforehand. So utilizing the e-collar is negative reinforcement or before the command, that's during the training phase. We get away from that once the dog truly knows that. Unless you were doing it to make obedience sharper. Let's say your dog comes into a nice heel, but it comes a little slow. Your dog is trained with the e-collar. Now you can start applying some pressure with the e-collar before the command, right? E-collar comes on. Now you could even use a little higher levels to motivate the dog because it knows it. So nothing bad's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now e-collar comes on at a higher level and you say, right, a heel. And now the dog's flying into yeah. it. Because it knows the command well, but it also knows how to better its situation. It knows how to turn the e-collar off. So that's how for advanced obedience, when I say we can make everything better, faster, sharper, that's one way you could do it. But you have to build yourself up to that. Does that make sense? Yes, that is so, so very helpful. Uh, it's funny. There have been some comments saying that Riko is really slow. So when you said that, that it would make her faster. Mm-hmm. That makes sense that it's like that someone in a car 
you know, cheering you on. Right. You're going to. Yeah, and listen, my, my female Malinois, Mango, my younger Malinois, she's kind of slow compared to Luca, where Luca, you know, there's no e collars, there's no nothing. He's, he flies into everything, like sometimes a little too much. <laughs> Mango is a little slower. I haven't done it because I have no need for her to be fast. I don't, I don't care. But I could do that in one day and make all that stuff much faster without – creating any kind of conflict or negative association with her because she understands the command mm -hmm. and she understands e-collar pressure. That's where a lot of people fail and they don't utilize the tool like it's capable of because all they think of it is as a stop, stop, stop instead of using it as a go, go, go. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. You could use it as a stop, but it's even more effective as a go. Mm -hmm. So for people that are, that aren't, um, don't you that can't afford or, or aren't using a trainer and they want to do it themselves at home yeah um, how will they know like when it's a good time to introduce it to their dog i referred to my book earlier when i wrote that it was for the general public the only thing i wanted was i wrote it because i wanted people to stop frying their dogs Trainers and owners. I got tired of seeing it. It, it gives the, the tool a bad name and it's not right on the animal. That was the whole premise of me writing it. Three and a half years ago, that was going on four years ago. When I wrote it, I expected to sell a couple dozen copies. And then after the first day, when I saw how many copies were sold, I was like, holy crap, this is kind of crazy. And then almost four years later, I'm still selling thousands of copies all over the world because of one reason I made it affordable for anyone to have. And I made it so anyone can train their dog with an eco anyone. So daily I get anywhere from 200 to 500 emails. And a lot of them are like, you saved our dog. Like our dog is off leash. And I get the videos, people running free and their dogs are at the beach or on hikes and anyone can do it. And I wouldn't say that if it wasn't the truth. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For me, the most important part of dog training is always going to be that relationship and how you live with the dog. So I'm not someone that pushes e-collars and say, put an e-collar on your dog. I'm actually quite opposite. Don't put the e-collar. Learn how to train with a leash first, okay? If you don't know how to work a dog on a leash, then you shouldn't be using e-collars. It's that simple because you're going to do a lot of things wrong. Learn the fundamentals of leash handling and basic communication. If you understand the basic way dogs understand us, then you'll be okay. You, you know, I mean, it's really, really simple, but you have to put a little bit of effort in so the dog understands what you want when you want it. And a lot of people don't get that, you know. Mm -hmm. So Cool Cookie is asking, can positive confusion be used in reactive dogs? Oh, yeah, that's that's where I started using it. Okay, someone said positive confusion. So they, they watch me. Okay, because that absolutely. Um, great question. And that's where I started using that. And why I kind of fell upon that and started seeing how beneficial it was. It was because of aggressive dogs and fearful dogs, how they were responding when we first started conditioning the e collar to them, that confusion was so beneficial to us. They just stopped all the bad behaviors while they were trying to figure out what was going on. That's why I started pushing that. But absolutely, 100%. But I don't only do that with e-collars. I do it with clickers, too, the positive confusion thing. Absolutely. Okay. RN Martinez, eight-and-a-half-month-old Dobie, e-collar training since six months using your videos. Reliable recall off-leash most of the time, but still at times stubborn when distracted. What's the correct way to handle increase level. Little, little, yeah, a little more pressure. Okay. Every now and then you're going to have to let the dog eight. Hey, no, you don't have a choice. Okay. So uh, that's a great question. I'm glad to hear that. So let's say your dog around the house works on a number six or seven, which is average on the mini educator. When you go out hiking or off leash or to a public place, don't have your e-collar set on a six or a seven because that's not going to mean anything to your dog in the real world. You know what I mean? You have to understand your dog and know where that e-collar is set to where if you call the dog and it doesn't respond, you can follow up at an appropriate level to let the dog know you're serious. Hey, you don't have a choice. You have to come to me. 
um, it'd be great to ask him what's his e-collar set on? Like what does the dog work on at home and what's he trying to use in those situations when the dog's distracted? Okay. He's, he's on here, so he'll probably respond. Okay. Um, babe, the deaf pup. I have a deaf dog. Would you go about conditioning the same way, continuous pressure and release? You, you know what, babe, the deaf pup? Um, E-collar training is great for deaf dogs. Most people use the vibration only for deaf dogs, okay? And I understand why they do it. But if you think about it, you're limiting the dog still. Because when the dog is only trained with the vibration, there's no consequences if your dog decides to blow you off. And a vibration is a consequence, okay? So if you wanted to use the vibration to call your dog, so let's say that's the command or the dog's name now, instead of using the dog's name because it can't hear you. So what I do with deaf dogs is that vibration tap means turn around and look at me. I have instructions for you. You know, then everything else is hand signals. But absolutely, it's, it, it works wonderfully. with. But I still condition the dogs the same way, except I add the vibration for the name to get the dog's attention, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so I see comments about from Archie, the GSD, about um, the use of a prong collar. So we mm -hmm. were advised by a Malinois trainer um, when we first got Rika to um, put the e – put the prong on Rika and, and get an e-collar and get the e-collar on. Um, mm -hmm. The prong collar, we, we were hesitant with both at first um, sure. because she was just very pulling like crazy. Like we were very mm -hmm. overwhelmed as first time Malinois owners. We knew sure. what we were getting into and you know knew that we needed outside help. Um, but the outside help said, use the prong collar. Um, I, I understand for the comments that, that that's really upsetting. Um, what is your, your take on putting a prong collar on a on Malinois at, at, eight, at 10 weeks or 12 weeks? It's, it's not something I do. Okay. Um, and, and here's why. And I talk about this a lot. First of all, a prong collar can make a lot, a lot of dogs, especially Malinois, a lot more reactive, a lot more activated, a lot more frustrated, okay? Mm -hmm. What I want from people, especially trainers, if you're a trainer and you're charging someone two, three, four, five thousand dollars to train a dog, then I don't think you should have to put a prong collar on a dog to get it to walk nicely. You know, I think you have to have the ability to teach a dog to walk nicely on a flat collar and a leash. And I get a lot of grief over that because pe that pisses people off. But it's usually people who have to use a prong collar to get a dog to walk nicely. And I'm not against prong collars. So it's just the way I prefer to do it is teach the dog to walk nice first and then add the tools. Then add the prong collar because then the prong collar is allowed to do what it's made to do without conflict in a really easy way. Like a very, very simple way, you know. And listen, there's very few dogs that you can't teach to walk nicely in five, ten minutes. It's very, very easy. I'm not against the tool. Prong collar is a great tool. It, it really is. But these people, these, especially Malinois, I see these reactive and aggressive Malinois or these working dogs, and they want to put a prong collar and correct the reactivity. Oh, my God. You're going to just make things worse, and that dog's going to get so fired up. And uh, that's where people fail over and over. So when a dog comes to me for training and it's got a prong collar on, we take it off. I take it off immediately, and I go to a flat collar, a leather collar, and a leash, and that's how we start everything, you know? I think a lot of the times with, like, I look back at Dave and I when we first started this journey with Rika, um, you know, there were a lot of people that were putting their dogs in board and train programs, and we didn't want to do that. We wanted to train mm -hmm. ourselves. Um, I, I always would think, and then I, we had the, the trainer that does board and trains suggests we put the prong collar and the e-collar the e on Rika. And I imagine that that's probably what is done at a board and train program. If that's. It depends where you go. It's overkill to me. What do you need both for? You know, I think, it's um, awesome. yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's not, it's not something I do. You know what right. I mean? And, and here's the thing. If I didn't want my dogs or clients dogs off leash, I'd never go. I'd never use an e-collar. Okay. 
I use e-collars for one reason. The big reason is to provide that off-leash freedom so a dog can be a dog. Dogs need to run. Dogs should experience life to the fullest, okay? And to do so, unless you live in a place where you don't have to worry about anything, you have to have some kind of safety net there, again, for that what-if moment. And that's the main reason why I love the tool. Um, I rarely use Pronka. I mean, hardly never. And anytime I have, it's been within the past year because someone said to me, someone that I respect a lot in the industry, we're talking one day and, you know, they said, listen, you've changed a lot of minds when it comes to the e-collar because of the work you've done and put out there. And that's why I appreciate that. Hey, someone I respect and look up to. And he said, imagine if you did that with the prong collar now. And I was like, oh, geez. Okay, I get it. <laughs> because a lot of people think I'm anti-prong collar and I'm not. I'm, I'm truly not. But too many people jump to a tool to try to fix a problem. And a tool will never bring out the best in a dog. Only training can do that. A tool can bring out the best in your training. But you have to learn to connect with that animal and teach the animal what is wanted, you know. And if you put the effort into that, listen, people see how these dogs are here with me when I get someone's dog in. You know, they're crazy about me. Clients know what their dog's going through when it comes here because the dogs can't lie. They can't lie. We have a good time. We train. We work. But I have a very strong relationship with these animals. And, you know, I just... Like I said, I'm not against prong collars, but I just like the purity and and the the art of training the dog with a leash and a flat collar. That yeah. that's it, you know. And I think a prong collar and e collar is total overkill to me. I just don't see the reason behind it. Yeah, I think also it depends on your lifestyle. Like, so we don't have a, a yard. We live in Los Angeles, and mm -hmm. we are on a busy street. There's always people around. There's always distractions. And when and we're very active, um, so like even the idea of Rika being in the yard and sure. digging that that doesn't happen because we're always together. We're right, at right. the park. Um, so it, it's the, the prong makes more sense for us because it's sure. always walking. So yeah. We, so many distractions. Yeah. So let let's say in your situation then, right? You want to use the prong collar. Awesome. Now you get your dog's food. You have its rations that it's going to eat at that meal. You have a flat collar on the dog, or let's say you want to jump right to the prong collar. You don't put the prong collar on and go for a walk and wait till the dog pulls. You put the prong collar on or the flat collar, right? You put the leash down so it's parallel to the ground. You apply a little straight line pressure to the right. The dog takes one step into the pressure. You release the pressure. You say, yes, you reward. Then you do it to the left. Then you do it towards you. Then you do it away from you. You teach the dog the leash pressure. The same way we do with the e-collar, you're just doing with the leash and the collar. This way, when you go for a walk then, and the dog starts pulling, then effortlessly you can control the dog because the dog was taught the leash pressure. Does that make sense? Yes. But people do the opposite. They put the collar on the dog thinking it's a, a miracle. It's a wonder tool, right? It, it's a magic wand. The dog pulls and they're correcting. And some dogs are going to pull right through that correcting. Some dogs are going to yelp. Some dogs are going to experience a lot of discomfort, but they didn't teach the leash pressure. Teach everything before you put the dog in that situation. Then you'll, you'll see a world of difference in when you do venture out. Because if you're going for a walk and the dog is constantly pulling you, you're just rewarding that behavior. And what I tell people, don't go for walks. Practice walking in front of your house and teach the dog how to walk first before you venture out. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, Patience is asking, Larry, what are you drinking? <laughs> oh, I'm drinking <laughs> wild turkey, rare breed, barrel proof. Nice. I think it's 118 proof. It's very good. It's delicious when it hits my lips. <laughs> okay, Katrina Mostner. Working with a one, one-year-old nervy Dober, Doberman since he was three months old, he thrives on black and white, but parents are determined to work in R, R plus. How would you present collar as a beneficial resource? I don't, what do you mean he thrives in black and white? Does that mean just it thrives in crystal clear communication, but they want to use positive reinforcement only? Is that what she's saying? That, yeah, that's probably what she means. 
here, here's the thing, you know, I use a ton of positive reinforcement, like 95, 96, 97% positive reinforcement is what I do. But when that's your only option, you're limiting the dog so much. And that creates a lot of issues with the dogs. If the dog is never taught no or how to get through conflict and to receive consequences, you know, it, it creates a very, very weak minded, very spoiled, um, you know, just, a, 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 I can't think of the word. It's just not mentally healthy for the dog. You know, it, it's just not. And so when a lot of positive reinforcement people, when they think of balance training or they hear the word punishment or correction, they're always thinking of something painful or brutal. That's not the case. I use very little physical punishment in my training. I mean, very little. I'm not against it. It's just that the more you know, the less you have to use punishment. You, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But there has to be more than just positive reinforcement. There has to be. It's not fair to the dog. And what happens is when there's only positive reinforcement, that becomes a very boring life for the dog. And then positive reinforcement is not so rewarding for the dog. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, canine sidekick. During the intermittent stage, am I rotating between pushing the button, the command, and tapping the button after the command? Or are you supposed to only tap after the command in intermittent stage? Well, it, it, it depends. You could, you could do both ways, okay? So let's say we're still going to utilize the continuous button before the command, right? We're still going to do that. But now, if we want to pick up clarity to the dog, if we want to pick up more speed and we want better response, now when we give the dog the command without the e-collar, let's say we tell the dog to down and the dog's a little slow, now you could tap afterwards, tap, 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 to speed up the response for the dog. Does that make sense? There is no rules. There's no right or wrong as long as the dog understands the communication and you're very consistent, okay? That's a good question. How long have you had a dog not eat or drink due to struggling during BMT? Oh, great question. Um, it's not uncommon for a dog to go a couple days without eating. And I don't withhold food. I know a lot of people withhold food because they want to make the dog train with food. If the dog, I don't. I feed the dogs in a bowl. I use food to train, but I also just feed them regularly. I had one dog that went four days without eating. The eating part doesn't bother me so much because mother nature is going to kick in. And when they're hungry, they're going to eat. The dog will never starve to death. But what scared me was it was day four and the dog didn't drink a drop of water. And that started scaring me. And there was, I tried everything and couldn't get the dog to take water. And I tried and I tried. And finally, day four, right before I was about to take the dog to the vet, they were going to have to put liquids under the skin to keep the dog hydrated. I finally got the dog to eat and drink. And it was some dumb shit I had to do. I mean, it was really, I tried everything. And everything failed until I literally put some water in the dog's bowl, even putting the food in the bowl with water. None of that stuff worked. The only thing that worked was me putting a bowl of water in the dog's crate and me standing above it and dropping kibble through the crate. And for some reason, the dog liked that and would eat it out of the water and then started drinking, you know. But four days, that was the drinking part was what's scary. Can you just give a little context of that? Of like yeah, sure. Um, the owner was extremely enabling to the dog, destroyed the dog mentally, okay? Worked from home, was with the dog 24 hours a day, which can be a blessing, but can also destroy a dog. So there was never any separation there, all right? The dog never learned to respect space. It was never told no, and the woman free fed the dog. The food was out all the time. Do food never went away. And I told her, we can't do this. You got to do that. It really messes a lot of dogs up. You know what I mean? So like I said, the first day, second day, when this dog didn't eat, it didn't phase me. That happens, you know? I'm going to give the dog food. It's going to have an opportunity to eat. But day two, when it's not drinking, I'm saying, okay, this isn't good. You know, this can get dangerous, you know? I worked the dog. It trained well. It did everything. But like I said, nothing I tried. Nothing I tried worked. But I kept trying things. 
I kept doing things. That fourth day was the day it was going to the vet. It was going to have to get IVs to get fluid and, you know. But for some reason, that stupid thing of being above the dog and dropping the food triggered something in the dog. It was like, oh, okay, I like this. And it took food that way, the only way. After that, it ate and drank normally. But you had to find something to break through. And every now and then, you're going to come across a dog that makes you really think outside the box, you know. Right. And you have to. You have to. I, I don't understand. The dog was just being stubborn and wouldn't. The dog was extremely stressed. It was really uncomfortable, you know. So stressed to the point that it wouldn't take drink water. Yeah, not even water. It wasn't going to the bathroom, wasn't doing anything. And that was created 100% in the home. Because when dogs come here, they're not in a stressful situation. Right. They're not in a facility with a bunch of barking dogs. They come in here and they kind of don't like to leave. They get a little yeah. down in the dumps when they go back home. Because they get a lot of interaction here and we have a good time and we work. And so they're never stressed coming here. But the second that dog was removed from its owner and removed from its very stagnant lifestyle, the same things every day, never experienced anything outside the home, it struggled. It couldn't handle it, you know? Wow. So interesting to hear the, the other side of it. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Any advice on a pity mix that has high prey drive with squirrels? She chases, she chases the second we let go of her leash in our yard and has run right through her two fences. Yeah, sure. You, you, that's, that's why e-collar training is so beneficial. You know, I just put up a video last week of a private session um, where the owner was going to have a heart attack because squirrels are her dogs. That's her main thing. But we've put in the work now, and now it's time to go to the park and find some squirrels. You know what I mean? And I didn't worry about it because I know how the dog's going to respond. But at first, owners are scared to death. You know, there is no other way that you could train that dog off of those squirrels except either keep it on leash or find a very good trainer that has an overall training program but also understands how to utilize an e-collar properly. So we're not going to put an e-collar on that dog and then punish the dog for going after the squirrels. Mm -hmm. We don't do that. We're not going to allow the dog to experience squirrels until we're two, three, four weeks in the training and the dog is completely literate to the e-collar training. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Then from there, we'll go out to a place where there's squirrels and we practice in that intermittent phase a little bit away from squirrels, not right on top of them. We teach the dog to recall away from the squirrels when we're at a distance to where the dog sees them and they're stressed, they want to go, but it's not over the top yet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And as we get better obedience and the dog is better trained with the e-collar, now we can throw the dog into the fire and let the dog off leash. Go ahead, go chase the squirrel and then practice calling it back. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it, it's not difficult, not difficult at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Larry, thank you so much for providing so much clarity on the e-collar. I, I feel like I, I understand it so much more and it's, it, it makes me feel, well, I want to read your book too. I feel like the next time I talk to you, I need to read your full book. Get the winged um, little yes, the definitely, um, definitely, and uh, yeah, and and try it out on Rika because I, yeah, like even in, inside because I want her like for these Q and As um, and sure. just stuff like when we're filming, I would like her next to me and like sure. her to be calm. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't like that she's so anxious running around; it makes me anxious. So I feel like the collar would be awesome for her. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and if you have questions along the way, call me. I'll send you my number. You don't hesitate to, to call me. You know, I talk to people every day, all day, because I'd rather people call and ask instead of doing the wrong thing or having some confusion. You know, right before I got on here with you, you know, four different people I'm watching videos they sent me. Mm -hmm. What am I doing wrong? What could I do better? That's that's what we're supposed to help each other. You know what I mean? That's that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. You know, the dogs win. That's it. That's what we want to do. Everyone's in it for the same thing. You know, give the dog the best opportunity it has. And I appreciate you doing this. Thanks for having me on. Barry, you're awesome. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much. And we'll definitely, I'll, I'll keep you posted on the progress. Yeah, please do. Please do. Love your channel too, by the Thank way. You. It's awesome. Love yours too. Thanks for having me. Have a good night, Larry. Peace. Thank you. Peace. Bye.